Hello my dears and welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm Shannon and today we're going to be reading some more from Emily of New Moon. I'm going to try to get two chapters done today, seven and eight. If you're just stumbling across this series, there's a playlist on my channel that has all of the previous chapters if you want to get caught up and uh, learn more about how and why I'm reading this. And otherwise, let's just get right into it. So this is chapter seven, the book of yesterday. That first Saturday and Sunday at New Moon always stood out in Emily's memory as a very wonderful time. So crowded was it with new and generally delightful impressions. If it be true that we count time by heartthrobs, Emily lived two years in it instead of two days. Everything was fascinating from the moment she came down the long polished staircase into the square hall that was filled with a soft rosy light coming through the red glass panes of the front door. Emily gazed through the panes delightedly. What a strange, fascinating red world she beheld with a weird red sky that looked, she thought, as if it belonged to the Day of Judgment. There was a certain charm about the old house which Emily felt keenly and responded to. It was a house which aforetime had had vivid brides and mothers and wives, and the atmospheres of their loves and lives still hung around it, not yet banished by the old maidishness of the regime of Elizabeth and Laura. Why, I'm going to love New Moon, thought Emily, quite amazed at the idea. Aunt Laura was setting the breakfast table in the kitchen, which seemed quite bright and jolly in the glow of morning sunshine. Even the black hole in the ceiling had ceased to be spookish and become only a commonplace entrance to the kitchen loft and on the red sandstone store step, Saucy Sow was sitting, preening her fur as contentedly as if she had lived at New Moon all of her life. Emily did not know it, but Sal had already drunk deep the delight of battle with her peers that morning, and taught the barn cats their place once and for all. Cousin Jimmy's big yellow tom had got a fearful drubbing and was minus several bits of his anatomy, while a stuck-up black lady cat who fancied herself considerably had made up her mind that if the gray and white narrow-faced interloper from goodness knew where was going to stay at New Moon, she was not. Emily gathered Sal up in her arms and kissed her joyously to the horror of Aunt Elizabeth, who was coming across the platform from the cookhouse with a plate of sizzling bacon in her hands. Don't you ever let me see you kissing a cat again, she ordered. Oh, all right, agreed Emily cheerfully. I'll only kiss her when you don't see me after this. I don't want any of your pertness, miss. You are not to kiss cats at all. Oh, but Aunt Elizabeth, I don't kiss her on the mouth, of course. I just kissed her between the ears. It's nice. Won't you try it just once and see for yourself? That will do, Emily. You've said quite enough, said Aunt Elizabeth, as she sailed on into the kitchen majestically, leaving Emily momentarily wretched. She felt that she had offended Aunt Elizabeth, and she hadn't the least notion how or why. But the scene before her was too interesting to worry long over Aunt Elizabeth. Delicious smells were coming from the cookhouse. A little slant-roofed building at the corner with a big cooking stove was placed in summer. It was quickly overgrown with hop vines, as most of the New Moon buildings were. To the right was the New Orchard, very wonderfully in blossom, but a rather commonplace spot after all since Cousin Jimmy cultivated it, most up-to-date fashion, and had grain growing to the wide spaces between the slight narrow rows of trees that looked all alike. But on the other side of the barn lane, just behind the well, was the Old Orchard, where Cousin Jimmy said the columbines grew, and which seemed to be a delightful place where trees had come up of their own will and grown into individual shapes and sizes where blue-eyed ivy twined about their roots and wild briar roses rioted over the gray paling fence. Straight ahead, closing the vista between the orchards was a little slope covered with huge white birches, among which were the big new moon barns and beyond the new orchard, a little lovable red road looped lightly up and up over a hill until it seemed to touch the vivid blue of the sky. Cousin Jimmy came down from the barns carrying brimming pails of milk and Emily ran with him to the dairy behind the cookhouse. Such a delightful spot she had never seen or even imagined. 
It was a snow-white little building in a clump of tall balm of Gileads. Its gray roof was dotted over with cushions of moss like fat green velvet mice. You went down six sandstone steps with ferns crowding about them and opened a white door with a glass panel in it and went down three more steps. And then you were in a clean, earthly smelling, damp, cool place with an earthen floor and windows screened by the delicate emerald of young hop vines and broad wooden shelves all around. Whereon stood wide, shallow pans of glossy brown ware full of milk, coated over with cream so rich that it was positively yellow. Aunt Laura was waiting for them, and she strained the milk into empty pans and then skimmed some of the full ones. Emily thought skimming was a lovely occupation and longed to try her hand at it. She also longed to sit right down and write a description of that, in that, of that dear diary, but alas, there was no account book. Still, she could write it in her head. She, squared, she squatted down on a three-legged stool in a dim corner and proceeded to do it, sitting so still that Jimmy and Laura forgot her and went away and later had to hunt for her for a quarter of an hour. This delayed breakfast and made Aunt Elizabeth very cross, but Emily had found just the right sentence to define the clear yet grim light that filled the dairy and was so happy over it that she didn't mind Aunt Elizabeth's black looks a bit. After breakfast, Aunt Elizabeth informed Emily that henceforth it would be one of her duties to drive the cows to pasture every morning. Jimmy has no hired man just now and it will save him a few minutes. And don't be afraid, added, added Aunt Laura. The cows know the way, so they'll go of themselves. You only have to follow and shut the gates. Oh, I am not afraid, said Emily. But she was. She knew nothing about cows. Still, she was determined that the Murray should not suspect a star of being scared. So, her heart beating like a trip hammer, she sailed valiantly forth and found that what Aunt Laura had said was true, and cows were not such ferocious animals after all. They went gravely on ahead, and she had only to follow through the old orchard, and then through the scrub maple growth beyond along a twisted ferny path where the wind woman was purring and peeping around the maple clumps. Emily loitered by the pasture gate until her eager, eager eyes had taken in all the geography of the landscape. The old pasture ran before her in a succession of little green blah, blah, blah. <laughs> The old pasture ran before her in a succession of little green bosoms, right down to the famous Blair Water, an almost perfectly round pond with grassy sloping treeless margins. Beyond it was the Blairwater Valley filled with homesteads and further out the great sweep of the white capped gulf. It seemed to Emily's eyes a charming land of green shadows and blue waters. Down in one quarter of the pasture, walled off by some old stone dyke, was the little private graveyard where the dead and gone Murrays were buried. Emily wanted to go and explore it but was too afraid to trust herself in the pasture. I'll go as soon as I get better acquainted with the cows, she resolved. Off to the right, on the crest of a steep little hill covered with young birches and firs, was a house that puzzled and intrigued Emily. It was gray and weather-worn, but it didn't look old. It had never been finished. The roof was shingled, but the stones were not, but the sides were not, and the windows were boarded over. Why had it never been finished? And it was meant to be such a pretty little house, a house you could love. A house where there would be nice chairs and cozy fires and bookcase. And lovely fat cats and unexpected corners. Then and there she named it the Disappointed House. And many an hour thereafter did she spend finishing that house, furnishing it as it should be furnished, and inventing the proper people and animals to live in it. To the left of the pasture field was another house of quite a different type, a big old house tangled over with vines, flat roofed with mansard windows, and a general air of indifference and neglect about it. A large, untidy lawn overgrown with unpruned shrubs and trees straggled right down to the pond where enormous willows drooped over the water. Emily decided that she would ask Cousin Jimmy about these houses when she got a good chance. She felt that, before she went back, she must slip along the pasture fence 
and explore a certain patch which she saw entering the grove of the spruce and maple further down. She did, and found that it led straight into fairyland along the bank of a wide, lovely brook, a wild, dear little path with lady ferns beckoning and blowing along it, the shyest of elven June bells under the firs, and little whims of loveliness at every curve. She breathed in the tang of fir blossom and saw the shimmer of gossamers high up in the boughs. And everywhere the frolic of elven lights and shadows, here and there the young maple branches interlaced as if to make a screen for dryad faces. Emily knew all about that thanks to her father and the great sheets of moss under the trees that were meant for Titania's couch. This is one of the places where dreams grow, said Emily happily. She wished the path might go on forever, but presently it veered away from the brook. And when she had scrambled over a mossy, old, broad fence, she found herself in the front garden of New Moon, where Cousin Jimmy was pruning some bushes. Oh, Cousin Jimmy, I found the dearest little road, said Emily. Coming up through Lofty John's bush? Oh, isn't it our bush, asked Emily, rather disappointed. No, but it ought to be. Fifty years ago, Uncle Archibald sold that jog of land to Lofty John's father, old Mike Sullivan. He built a little house down near the pond and lived there till he quarreled with Uncle, Uncle Archibald, which wasn't long, of course, and then he moved his house across the road, and Lofty John lives there now. Elizabeth has tried to buy the land back from him. She's offered him far more than it's worth, but Lofty John won't sell, just for spite, seeing that he has a good farm of his own and this piece isn't much good to him. He only pastures a few young cattle on it through the summer, and what was cleared is all grown up with scrub maple. It's a thorn in Elizabeth's side, and likely to be as long as Lofty John nurses his spite. Why is he called Lofty John? Because he's a high and lofty fellow, but never mind him. I want to show you around my garden, Emily. It's mine. Elizabeth bosses the farm, but she lets me run the garden to make up for pushing me into the well. Did she do that? Yes, she didn't mean to, of course. We were just children. I was here on a visit, and the men were putting a new hood on the well and cleaning it. It was open, and we were playing tag around it, and I made Elizabeth mad. I forget what I said. Twasn't hard to make her mad, you understand. And she may, and she made to give me a bang on the head. I saw it coming, and I stepped back to get out of the way. And down I went, head first. Don't remember anything more about it. There was nothing but mud at the bottom, but my head struck the stones at the side. I was took up for dead, my head all cut up. Poor Elizabeth was... Cousin Jimmy shook his head, as if to intimate that it was impossible to describe how or what poor Elizabeth was. I got about after a while, though, pretty near as good as new. Folks say I've never been quite right since, but they only say that because I'm a poet, and nothing ever worries me. Poets are so scarce in Blair Water, folks don't understand them, and most people worry so much they think you're not right if you don't worry. Won't you recite some of your poetry to me, Cousin Jimmy, asked Emily. When the spirit moves me, I will. It's no use to ask me when the spirit doesn't move me. But how am I to know when the spirit's moving you, Cousin Jimmy? I'll begin of my own accord to recite my compositions, but I'll tell you this. The spirit generally moves me when I'm boiling the pig's potatoes in the fall. Remember that and be around. Why don't you write your poetry down? The paper's too scarce at New Moon. Elizabeth has some pet economies and writing paper of any kind is not one of them. But haven't you any money of your own, Cousin Jimmy? Oh, Elizabeth pays me good wages, but she puts all my money in the bank and just doles out a few dollars to me once in a while. She says I'm not fit to be trusted with money, and when I came here to work for her, she paid me my wages at the end of the month, and I started for Shrewsbury to put it in the bank. I met a tramp on the road, a poor forlorn creature without a cent, and I gave him the money, because why not? I had a good home and a steady job and clothes enough for me for years. I suppose it was the foolishest thing I ever did, and the nicest, but Elizabeth never got over it. She's managed my money ever since, but some come... But come you now, and I'll show you my garden before I have to go and sow the turnips. The garden was a beautiful place, well worthy of Cousin Jimmy's pride. It seemed like a garden where no frost could wither or rough wind blow. A garden remembering a hundred vanished summers. There was a high hedge of clipped spruce all around it, spaced at intervals by tall Lombardies. The north side was closed in by a thick groove of spruce against which a long row of peonies grew. 
their great red blossoms splendid against its darkness. One big spruce grew in the center of the garden, and underneath it was a stone bench made of flat, sure stones, worn smooth by long polish of wind and rain and wave. In the southeast corner was an enormous clump of lilacs, trimmed into the semblance of one large drooping tree, gloried over with purple. An old summer house covered with vines filled the southwest corner, and in the northwest corner there was a sundial of gray stone, placed just where the broad red walk that was bordered with striped grass, and picked out with pink conches ran off into Lofty John's bush. Emily had never seen a sundial before and hung over it rap enraptured. Your great-great-grandfather, Hugh Murray, had that brought out from the old country, said Cousin Jimmy. There isn't as fine a one in the maritime provinces, and Uncle George Murray brought those conches from the Indies. He was a sea captain. Emily looked about her with delight. The garden was lovely and the house quite splendid to her childish eyes. It had a big front porch with Grecian columns. These were thought very elegant in Blair Water and went far to justify the Murray pride. A schoolmaster had said they gave the house a classical air. To be sure, the classical effect was just now rather smothered in hop vines than rioted over the whole porch and hung in pale green festoons above the rows of potted scarlet geraniums that flanked the steps. Emily's heart swelled with pride. It's a noble house, she said. And what about my garden, asked Cousin Jimmy jealously. It's fit for a queen, said Emily gravely and sincerely. Cousin Jimmy nodded, very pleased, and then a strange sound crept into his voice and an odd look into his eyes. There's a spell woven round this garden. The blight shall spare it, and the green warm passed it by. Drought dares not invade it, and the rain comes here gently. Emily took an involuntary step backwards. She almost felt like running away, but now Cousin Jimmy was himself again. This, isn't this grass about the sundial like green velvet? I've taken some pains with it, I can tell you. You make yourself at home in this garden. Cousin Jimmy made a splendid gesture. I confer the freedom of it upon you. Good luck to you. And may you find the lost diamond. The lost diamond, said Emily. What fascinating thing was this? Never heard the story? Never hear the story? I'll tell it tomorrow. Sunday is a lazy day at New Moon. I must get off to my turnips now, or I'll have Elizabeth out looking for me, and she won't say anything. She'll just look. Ever seen the real Murray look? I guess I saw it when Aunt Ruth pulled me out from under the table, said Emily. No, no. That was the Ruth Dutton look. Spite and malice and all uncharitableness, I hate Ruth Dutton. She laughs at my poetry, not that she ever hears any of it. The spirit never moves when Ruth is around, I'll tell you that. I don't know where they got her. Elizabeth's a crank, but she's sound as a nut. And Laura's a saint, but Ruth? She's worm-eaten. As for the Murray look, you'll know it when you see it. It's as well known as the Murray pride. We're a darn queer lot, but we're the finest people ever happened. I'll tell you all about us tomorrow. Cousin Jimmy kept his promise while the aunts were away at church. It had been decided in family conclave that Emily was not to go to church that day. She has nothing suitable to wear, said Aunt Elizabeth. By next Sunday, we'll have her white dress ready. Emily was disappointed that she wasn't able to go. She had always found church very interesting on the rare occasions when she got there. It had been too far at Maywood, at Maywood for her father to walk, but sometimes Ellen Green's brother had taken her and Ellen. Do you think, Aunt Elizabeth, she said wistfully, that God would be much offended if I wore a black dress to church? Of course it's cheap, but it covers me all up. Little girls who do not understand things should hold their tongues, said Aunt Elizabeth. I do not choose that Blairwater people should see my niece in such a dress as that wretched black one. And if Ellen Green paid for it, we must repay her. You should have told us that before we came away from Maywood. No, you are not going to church today. You can wear the black dress to school tomorrow. We can cover it up with an apron. Emily resigned herself with a sigh of disappointment to staying home, but it was very pleasant after all. Cousin Jimmy took her for a walk to the pond, showed her the graveyard, and opened the book of yesterday for her. 
Why are all the Murrays buried here? asked Emily. Is it really because they're too good to be buried with common people? Oh, no, no, no. We don't carry our pride as far as that. When old Hugh Murray settled at New Moon, there was nothing but woods for miles and no graveyards nearer than Charlottetown. And that's why the old Murrays were buried here, and later on we kept it up because we wanted to lie with our own, here on the green, green banks of the old Blair Water. That sounds like a line out of a poem, Cousin Jimmy, said Emily. So it is one of my poems, he said proudly. I kind of like the idea of exclusive burying ground like this, said Emily decidedly, looking around her approvingly at the velvet grass, slopping down to the fairy blue pond, the neat walks, the well-kept graves. Cousin Jimmy chuckled. And yet they say you ain't a Murray, he said. Murray and bird and star and a dash of Shipley to boot, or Cousin Murray, or Cousin Jimmy Murray is much mistaken. Shipley, she asked. Yes, Hugh, Mur Hugh Murray's wife, your great-great-grandmother, was a Shipley, an Englishwoman. Ever hear of how the Murrays came to New Moon? No. Well, they were bound for Quebec, hadn't any notion of coming to PEI. They had a long, rough, rough voyage, and the water got scarce, so the captain of the New Moon put her in here to get some. Mary Murray had nearly died of seasickness coming out. Never seemed to get her sea legs, so the captain, being sorry for her, told her she should go ashore with the men and feel solid ground under her for an hour or so. Very gladly she went, and when she got to shore, she said, Here I stay. And uh, stay she did. Nothing could budge her. Old Hugh, he was young Hugh then, of course, coaxed and stormed and raged and argued and even cried, I've been told. But Mary wouldn't move. In the end, he gave in and had his belongings landed and stayed too. So that's how the Murrays came to P.E. Island. I'm glad it happened like that, said Emily. So was old Hugh in the long run, and yet it rankled Emily. It rankled. He never forgave his wife with a whole heart. Her grave's over there in the corner, that one with the flat red stone. Go you and look at what he had put on it. Emily ran over curiously. The big flat stone was inscribed with one of the long, discursive epitaphs of an older day. But beneath it was no scriptural verse or pious psalm, clear and distinct in spite of age and <laughs> clear and distinct in spite of age ran the line, here I stay. That's how he got even with her, said Cousin Jimmy. He was a good husband to her, and she was a good wife, and bore him a fine family, and he never was the same after her death, but that rankled him until it had to come out. Emily gave a little shiver. Somehow the idea of that grim old ancestor with his undying grudge against his nearest and dearest was rather terrifying. I'm glad I'm only half Murray, she said to herself aloud. Father told me it was a Murray tradition, not to carry spite past the grave. So tis now, but it took its rise from the very thing. His family were so horrified at it, you see, it made considerable of a scandal. Some folks twisted it around to me that old Hugh didn't believe in the resurrection and there was talk of the session taking it up. But after a while, the talk died away. <clears throat> Emily skipped over to another lynchon grown stone. Elizabeth Burnley. Who was she, Cousin Jimmy? Old William Murray's wife. He was Hugh's brother and came out here five years after Hugh did. His wife was a great beauty, and she had been a belle in the old country. She didn't like the P.E. Island woods. She was homesick, Emily, scandalously homesick. For weeks after she came here, she couldn't take off her bonnet. She just walked to the floor in it, demanding to be taken back home. Didn't she take it off when she went to bed, asked Emily. I don't know if she did go to bed. Anyway, William wouldn't take her back home, so in time she took off her bonnet and resigned herself. Her daughter married Hugh's son, so Elizabeth was your great-great-grandmother. Emily looked down at the sunken green grave and wondered if any homesick dreams haunted Elizabeth Burnley's slumber of a hundred years. It's dreadful to be homesick, I know, she thought sympathetically. Little Stephen Murray's buried over here, said Cousin Jimmy. His was the first marble stone in the burying ground. He was your grandfather's brother, died when he was twelve. He has become a Murray tradition. Why? Because he was so beautiful and clever and good, he hadn't a fault, so of course he couldn't live. They said there was never such a handsome child in the connection, and lovable, everybody loved him. He's been dead for 90 years, not a Murray living today ever saw him, and yet we talk about him at family gatherings. He's more real than lots of living people, so you see, Emily, he must have been an extraordinary child, but... 
It ended in that. Cousin Jimmy waved his hand towards the grassy grave. I wonder, thought Emily, if anyone will remember me 90 years after I'm dead. This old yard is nearly full, reflected Cousin Jimmy. There's just room in yonder corner for Elizabeth and Laura and me. None for you, Emily. Oh, I don't want to be buried here, flashed Emily. I think it's splendid to have a graveyard like this in the family, but I'm going to be buried in Charlottetown with father and mother. But there's one thing that worries me, Cousin Jimmy. Do you think I'm likely to die of consumption? Cousin Jimmy looked judiciously down into her eyes. No, he said, no. You've got enough life in you to carry you far. You aren't meant for death. I feel that too, said Emily, nodding. And now, Cousin Jimmy, why is that house over there disappointed? Which one? Oh, Fred Clifford's house. Fred Clifford began to build that house 30 years ago. He was to be married, and his lady picked out the plan. And when the house was just as far along as you see, she jilted him. Right in the face of day, she jilted him. Never another nail was driven into the house. Fred went out to British Columbia. He's living there yet, married and happy, but he won't sell that lot to anyone, so I reckon he still feels the sting. I'm so sorry for that house. I wish it had been finished. It wants to be. Well, I reckon it never will. Fred had a bit of Shipley in him, too, you see. One of Hugh's girls was his grandmother. And Dr. Burnley up there in the big gray house has more than a bit. Is he a relation of ours too, Cousin Jimmy? Forty-second cousin. Way back he had a cousin of Mary Shipley's for a great something, but that was in the old country. His forebears came out here after we did. He's a good doctor, but not stick. Otter by far than I am, Emily, and yet nobody ever says he's not all there. Can you account for that? He doesn't believe in God, and I am not such a fool as that. Not in any god? Not in any god. He's an infidel, Emily, and he's bringing his little girl up in the same way, which I think is a shame, said Cousin Jimmy confidently. Doesn't her mother teach her things? Her mother is gone, answered Cousin Jimmy with a little odd hesitation. For about ten years, he added in a firmer tone. Lise Burnley is a great girl, hair like daffodils and eyes like yellow diamonds. Oh, Cousin Jimmy, you promised you'd tell me about the lost diamond, cried Emily eagerly. To be sure, to be sure. Well, it's there, somewhere in or about the old summer house, Emily. Fifty years ago, Edward Murray and his wife came here from Kingsport for a visit. A great lady she was. And wearing silks and diamonds like a queen, though no beauty. She had a ring on with a stone in it that cost two hundred pounds, Emily. That was a big lot of money to be wearing on one wee woman finger, wasn't it? It sparkled on her white hand as she held her dress going up the steps of the summer house, but when she came down the steps, it was gone. And it was never found, asked Emily. Never. And for no lack of searching, Edward Murray wanted to have the house built. Edward Murray wanted to have the house pulled down. But Uncle Archibald wouldn't hear of it, because he had built it for his bride. The two brothers quarreled over it and were never good friends again, and everybody in the connection has taken a spell hunting for the diamond. Most folks think it fell out the summer house among the flowers or shrubs, but I know better, Emily. I know Mary and Murray's diamond is somewhere about that old house yet. On moonlit nights, Emily, I've seen it glinting, glinting and beckoning, but never in the same place. And when you go to it, it's gone and you see it laughing at you from somewhere else. Again, there was that eerie, indefinable something in Cousin Jimmy's voice, or look that gave, Ev that gave Emily a suddenly crinky feeling in her spine. But she loved the way he talked to her as if she were a grown-up, and she loved the beautiful land around her, and in spite of the ache for her father and the house in the hollow, which persisted all the time and hurt her so much at night that her pillow was wet with secret tears. She was beginning to be a little glad again in sunset and birdsong and early white stars. In moonlit nights and singing winds, she knew life was going to be wonderful here. Wonderful and interesting. What with the outdoor cookhouses and cream-girdled dairies and the pond paths and the sundials and lost diamonds. And disappointed houses and men who didn't believe in any god, not even Ellen Green's god. Emily hoped she would soon see Dr. Burnley. She was very curious to see what an infidel looked like. And she had already quite made up her mind that she would find the lost diamond. 
Chapter 8, Trial by Fire. Aunt Elizabeth drove Emily to school the next morning. Aunt Laura had thought that since there was only a month before vacation, it was not worthwhile for Emily to start school, but Aunt Elizabeth did not yet feel comfortable with a small niece skipping around New Moon, poking into everything insatiably, and was resolved that Emily must go to school to get her out of the way. Emily herself, always avid for new experiences, was quite keen to go. But for all that, she was seething with rebellion as they drove along. Aunt Elizabeth had produced a terrible gingham apron with an equally terrible gingham sunbonnet for somewhere in the new moon garret and made Emily put them on. The apron was a long sack-like garment high in the neck with sleeves. Those sleeves were the crowning indignity. Emily had never seen any little girl wearing an apron with sleeves. She rebelled to the point of tears over wearing it, but Aunt Elizabeth was not going to have any of this nonsense. Emily saw the Murray look then. When she saw it, she buttoned her rebellious feelings tightly up in her soul and let Aunt Elizabeth put the apron on her. It was one of your mother's aprons when she was a little girl, Emily, said Aunt Laura comfortingly and rather sentimentally. Then, said Emily, I don't wonder why she ran away with father when she grew up. Aunt Elizabeth finished buttoning the apron and gave Emily a note, a none too gentle push away from her. Put on your sunbonnet, she ordered. Oh, please, Aunt Elizabeth, don't make me wear that thing. Aunt Elizabeth, wasting no further words, picked up the bonnet and tied it on Emily's head. Emily had to yield, but from the depths of the sunbonnet issued a voice, defiant though tremulous. Anyway, Aunt Elizabeth, you can't boss God, it said. Aunt Elizabeth was too cross to speak all the way to the schoolhouse. She introduced Emily to Miss Brownwell and drove away. School was already in, so Emily hung her sunbonnet on the porch nail and went to the desk Miss Brownwell assigned her. She had already made up her mind that she did not like Miss Brownwell and never would. <laughs> Miss Brownwell had the reputation in Blairwater of being a fine teacher due mainly to the fact that she was a strict disciplinarian and kept excellent order. She was a thin middle-aged person with a colorless face, prominent teeth, most of which she showed when she laughed, and cold, watchful gray eyes, colder even than Aunt Ruth's. Emily felt as if those merciless agate eyes saw clean through her to the core of her sensitive little soul, and Emily could be fearless enough on occasion, but in the presence of a nature which she instinctively felt to be hostile to her, she shrank away in something that was more repulsion than fear. She was a target for curious glances all morning. The Blair Water School was large, and there were at least twenty little girls about her age. Emily looked back curiously at them and thought the way they whispered to each other behind hands and books when they looked at her very ill-mannered. She felt suddenly unhappy and homesick and lonesome. She wanted her father and her old home and the dear things she loved. The new moon girl is crying, whispered a black-eyed girl across the aisle and then came a cruel little giggle. What's the matter with you, Emily, said Miss Brownwell suddenly and accusingly. Emily was silent. She could not tell Miss Brownwell what was the matter with her, especially when Miss Brownwell used such a tone. When I ask one of my pupils a question, Emily, I'm accustomed to having an answer. Why are you crying? There was another giggle from across the aisle. Emily lifted miserable eyes in her, and her extremity fell back on the phrase of her father's. It's a matter that concerns only myself, she said. A red spot suddenly appeared in Miss Brownwell's shallow cheek. Her eyes gleamed with cold fire. You will remain in during recess as a punishment, she said, but she felt Emily alone, but she left Emily alone the rest of the day. Emily did not in the least mind staying in at recess, for ac acutely sensitive to her environment as she was. She realized that for some reason she could not fathom the atmosphere of the school was antagonistic. The glances cast at her were not only curious but ill-natured. She didn't want to go out to the playground with those girls. She didn't want to go to school in Blairwater, but she would cry. She would not cry anymore. She sat erect and kept her eyes on her book. Suddenly a soft, malignant hiss came across the aisle. Miss Pridey, Miss Pridey. Emily looked across at the girl. Large, steady, purplish, gray eyes glanced into beady, twinkling black ones. Gaze un 
gazed uncoilingly with something in them that cowed and compelled. The black eyes wavered and fell, their owner covering her retreat with another giggle and a toss of her short braid hair. I can master her, thought Emily, with a thrill of triumph. But there is strength in numbers, and at noon hour she found herself standing alone on the playground, facing a crowd of unfriendly faces. Children can be the most cruel creatures alive. They have the herd instinct of prejudice against any outsider, and they are merciless in its indulgence. Emily was a stranger in one of the proud Murrays, two counts against her, and there was about her, small and ginghamed and sunbonneted as she was, a certain reserve and dignity and fineness that they resented, and they resented the leveled way she looked at them. With that disdainful face under cloudy black hair instead of being shy and drooping as became an interloper on probation. You're a pr proud one, said Black Eyes. Oh my, you may have buttoned boots, but you are living on charity. Emily had not wanted to put on the button boots. She wanted to go barefoot as she always had done in the summer, but Aunt Elizabeth had told her that no child from New Moon had ever gone barefoot to school. Oh, just look at the baby apron, laughed another girl with a head of chestnut curls. Now Emily flushed. This was indeed the vulnerable point in her armor. Delighted at her success in drawing blood, the curled one tried again. Is that your grandmother's sunbonnet? There was a chorus of giggles. Oh, she wears the sunbonnet to save her complexion. That's the Murray pride. The Murrays are rotten with pride, my mother says. You're awful ugly, said a squat little miss, nearly as broad as she was long. Your ears look like a cat's. You needn't be so proud, said Black Eyes. Your kitchen ceiling isn't plastered even, and your cousin Jimmy's an idiot, said one of the girls. He isn't, cried Emily. He has more sense than any of you. You can say what you like about me, but you do not insult my family. If you say one more word, then I'll look you over with the evil eye. Nobody understood what this threat meant, but that made it all the more effective, and it produced a brief silence, and then the bathing began again in a different form. Can you sing? Asked the thin, freckled girl, who yet contrived to be very pretty in spite of her thinness and her freckles. No, said Emily. Can you dance? No. Can you sew? No. Can you cook? No. Can you knit lace? No. Can you crochet? No. And what can you do, said the freckled one in a contemptuous tone. I can write poetry, said Emily, without in the least meaning to say it, but in that instance she knew she could write poetry, and with this unreasonable conviction came the flash. Right there, surrounded by hostility and suspicion, fighting alone for her standing without backing or advantage, came the wonderful moment when the soul seemed to cast aside the bonds of flesh and spring upward to the stars. The rapture and delight on Emily's face amazed and enraged her foes. They thought it a manifestation of Murray pride and an uncommon accomplishment. You lie, said one of the girls. A star does not lie, retorted Emily. The flash was gone, but its uplift remained. She looked them all over with a cool detachment that quelled them temporarily. Why don't you like me, she asked directly. There was no reply. Emily looked straight at Chestnut Curls and repeated her question. Chestnut Curls felt herself compelled to answer. Because you're not like us, she muttered. I wouldn't want to be, said Emily. Oh my, you are one of the chosen people, mocked the girl with the black eyes. Of course I am, resorted Emily. She walked away to the schoolhouse, conqueror in that battle, but the forces against her were not so easily cowed. There was much whispering and plotting after she had gone in, a conference with some of the boys and a handling over of the bedizened pencils and shoes of gum for value received. An agreeable sense of victory and the afterglow of the flash carried Emily through the afternoon in spite of the fact that Miss Brownwell ridiculed her for her mistakes in spelling. Miss Brownwell was very fond of ridiculing her pupils. All the girls in the class giggled except one who had not been there in the morning and was consequently at the tail. Emily had been wondering who she was. She was as unlike the rest of the girls as Emily herself, but in totally different ways. She was tall, oddly dressed in an overlong dress of faded, striped print and barefoot. Her thick hair cut short fluffed out all around her head. In a bushy wave that seemed to be of brilliant spun gold, and her glowing eyes were of a brown so light and translucent as to be almost amber. 
Her mouth was large, and she had a saucy pointed chin. Pretty she might not be called, but her face was so vivid and mobile that Emily could not drag her fascinated eyes from it. And she was the only girl in class who did not, sometime, though, through the lesson, get a barb of sarcasm from Miss Brownwell, though she made as many mistakes as the rest of them. At recess, one of the girls came up to Emily with a box in her hand. Emily knew that she was Rhoda Stewart and thought her very pretty and sweet. Rhoda had been in the crowd around her at the noon hour, but she had not said anything. And she was dressed in a crisp pink gingham. She had smooth, lustrous braids of sugar brown hair, big blue eyes, a rosebud mouth, doll-like features, and a sweet voice. If Miss Brownwell could be said to have a favorite, it was Rhoda Stewart. And she seemed generally popular in her own set and much petted by the older girls. Here, this is a present for you, she said sweetly. Emily took the box unsuspectingly. Rhoda's smile would have disarmed any suspicion. For a moment, Emily was happily anticipant as she removed the cover, but then with a shriek she flung the box from her and stood pale and trembling from head to foot. There was a snake in the box. Whether dead or alive, she didn't know and she didn't care. For any snake, Emily had a horror and repulsion she could not overcome. The very sight of one almost paralyzed her. A chorus of giggles ran around the porch. Before I'd be so scared of an old day dead snake. Can you write poetry about that, giggled Chestnut Curls? I hate you, cried Emily. You're mean, hateful girls. Calling names isn't ladylike, said the freckled one. I thought a Murray would be too grand for that. If you come to school tomorrow, Miss Star, said Black Eyes deliberately, we're going to take that snake and put it around your neck. Let me see you do it, cried a clear ringing voice. Into their midst with bound came the girl with amber eyes and short hair. Just let me see you do it, Jenny. This isn't any of your business, Elise Burnley, muttered Jenny sullenly. Oh, isn't it? Don't you sass me. Elise walked up to the retreating Jenny and shook a sunburned fist in her face. If I catch you teasing Emily Star tomorrow with that snake again, I'll take it by the tail and you by your tail and slash you across the face with it. Mind that. Now you go and pick up that precious snake of yours and throw it down on the ash pile. Jenny actually went and did it. Now, Elise said facing the others, Clear out, all of you, and leave the new moon girl alone after this, she said. If I hear any more meddling and sneaking, you'll be in big trouble. And yes, <laughs> I'll cut off your ears and wear them pinned on my dress. <laughs> Cowed by these ferocious threats, or by something in Elise's personality, Emily's persecutors drifted away. Elise turned to Emily. Don't mind them, she said contemptuously. They're jealous of you, that's all. Jealous because you live at New Moon and ride in a fringe top buggy and wear button boots. You smack their mugs if they give you any more of their jaw. Elise vaulted the fence and tore off into the maple bush without another glance at Emily. Only Rhoda Stewart remained. Emily, I'm awfully sorry, she said, rolling her big blue eyes appealingly. I didn't know there was a snake in the box. Cross my heart, I didn't. The girls just told me it was a present for you. You're not mad at me, are you? Because I do like you. Emily had been mad and hurt and outraged, but this little bit of friendliness melted her instantly. In a moment, she and Rhoda had their arms around each other, parading across the playground. I'm going to ask Miss Brownwell if you can sit with me, said Rhoda. I used to sit with Annie Great, but she moved away. You'd like to sit with me, wouldn't you? I'd love it, said Emily warmly. She was as happy as she had been miserable. Here was the friend of her dreams. Already she worshipped Rhoda. We ought to sit together, said Rhoda importantly. We belong to the best two families in Blair Water. Do you know that if my family had his rights, he would be on the throne? Oh, that if my father had his rights, he would be on the throne of England? England, said Emily, too amazed to do anything but echo. Yeah. We're descended from the kings of Scotland, said Rhoda, so of course we don't associate with everybody. My father keeps store and I'm taking music lessons. Is your Aunt Elizabeth going to give you music lessons? I don't know, said Emily. She ought to. She's very rich, isn't she? I don't know, said Emily again. She wished Rhoda would not ask such questions. Emily thought it was hardly good manners, but surely a descendant of the Stuart kings ought to know the rules of breeding if anybody did. She's got an awful temper, hasn't she, said Rhoda. No, she hasn't. 
Well, she nearly killed your cousin Jimmy in one of her rages, said Rhoda. It's true, Mother told me. Why doesn't your Aunt Laura get married? Has she got a beau? What wages does your Aunt Elizabeth pay your cousin Jimmy? I don't know, said Emily. Well, I suppose you haven't been at New Moon long enough to find things out, but it must be very different from where you're, from what you're used to, I guess. Your father was as poor as a church mouse, wasn't he? My father was a very, very rich man, said Emily. Rhoda stared. I thought he hadn't a cent. He didn't, said Emily, but people can be rich without money. I don't see how, but anyway, you'll be rich someday. Your Aunt Elizabeth will likely leave you all her money, Mother says, so I don't care if you are living on charity. I love you, and I'm going to stick up for you. Have you got a bow, Emily? No, said Emily, blushing violently and quite scandalized at the idea. I'm only 11. <laughs> oh, somebody in our class has a bow. Mine is Teddy Kent. I shook hands with him after I'd counted nine stars for nine nights without missing a night. If you do that, the first boy you shake hands with afterwards is to be your beau. But it's awful hard to do. It took me all winter. Teddy wasn't in school today. He's been sick all June. He's the best looking boy in Blair Water. You'll have a beau too, Emily. Uh, I don't want one, declared Emily. I don't know a thing about bows, and I won't have one. Rhoda tossed her head. Oh, I suppose you think there's nobody good enough for you. Living at New Moon? Well... You won't be able to play clap in, clap out if you have an avo. Emily knew nothing of the mysteries of clap in, clap out, and didn't care. Anyway, she wasn't going to have a bow, and she repeated this in such decided tones that Rhoda deemed it wise to drop the subject. Emily was alone from the crossroads where she had parted company with Rhoda, and she reviewed the events of the day with a feeling that, after all, she had kept a star flag flying, except for a temporary reverse in the matter of the snake. School was very different from what she had expected it to be, but that was the way in life. She had heard Ellen Green say, and you just had to make the best of it. Rhoda was a darling, and there was something about Lee's Burnley that she liked, and as for the rest of the girls, Emily got square with them by pretending she saw them all being hanged in a row for frightening her to death with a snake, and felt no more resentment towards them. Although... Some of the things that had been said to her rankled her bit bitterly in her heart for many a day. She had no father to tell them to and no account book to write them out in, so she could not exercise them. She had no speedy chance to ask for a bang, for there was company at New Moon, and her aunts were busy getting ready an elaborate supper. But when the preserves were brought on, Emily snatched the opportunity of a lull in the older conversation. Aunt Elizabeth, she said, can I have a bang? Aunt Elizabeth looked her disdain. No, she said. I do not approve of bangs. Of all the silly fashions that have come in nowadays, nowadays bangs are the silliest. Oh, Aunt Elizabeth, do let me have a bang. It would make a beauty of me. It would take a good deal more than a bang <laughs> to do that. Emily, we, all, we will not have bangs at New Moon except on the molly cows. They are the only creatures that should wear bangs. Aunt Elizabeth smiled triumphantly around the table. Aunt Elizabeth did smile sometimes when she thought she had silenced some small person by exquisite ridicule. Emily understood that it was no use to hope for banks. Loveliness did not lie that way for her. It was mean of Aunt Elizabeth. Mean? She heaved a sigh of disappointment and dismissed the idea for the present. There was something else she wanted to know. Why doesn't Elise Burnley's father believe in God, she asked. "'Cause of the trick her mother played him,' said Mr. Slade with a chuckle. Mr. Slade was a jolly-looking old man with bushy hair and whiskers. He had already said some things Emily could not understand, and which had seemed greatly to embarrass his very ladylike wife. "'What trick did Elise's mother play?' asked Emily, all agog with interest. Now Aunt Laura looked at Aunt Elizabeth, and Aunt Elizabeth looked at Aunt Laura, and then the la latter said, "'Run out and feed the chickens, Emily.' Emily rose with dignity. You might just as well tell me that Elise's mother isn't to be talked about, and I would obey you. I understand perfectly what you mean, she said, as she left the table. <laughs> so there you go. Those were chapters 7 and 8. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you're having a good weekend. It is, we're, it's different because we are filming this story in the daytime. Normally this is a video I film at night, but... 
Uh, I just figured I'd get it filmed now so I can get it out today and that you can enjoy it sooner. <laughs> anyway, to everyone that has left kind comments about really enjoying this content, thank you so much. And to the new subscribers who came from Kathy's Instagram stories, uh, again, thank you. And I hope you enjoy. And I will see you guys on Monday with a new vlog. Bye.